Okay, welcome to part two of our discussion of methods of instruction, this introductory video of methods of instruction. In our first video, we discussed direct instruction as well as learning theories. We discussed transmissive views of instruction. In this video, we're going to transition a little bit toward talking about constructivist approaches to instruction, interactive instruction. Now, uh, this is very lively. This is oftentimes conversational. It's risky even uh, because there is the possibility that something could go wrong, something could go off script, but every once in a while that aha learning moment happens in an unplanned uh, way and that's okay. There's some key things that I want to highlight here. Group inquiry. Sometimes we learn best in groups with each other, through interaction, through cooperation. But that means our students need to know how to cooperate. They don't need to know how to interact. We downplay the importance of preparation of how to work together. We set rules in place, but we don't model those rules. And guess what? Our students are careful observers. If we don't work together well enough with each other as fellow teachers, teachers and administrators, why do we expect our students to work well? Think about it for a moment. Hypothetically, let's imagine what the students are observing when they watch you co-teach, if they ever do watch you co-teach, because depending on the school setting, co-teaching might not be taking place. When there's partnership that takes place in your room, co-teaching, is it a partnership that is respectful? Or is it a partnership where one person is clearly in power and the other person is not? Is it an oppressor versus oppressed? When there is interaction between two professionals in front of them, Let's say an administrator walks into the classroom. Are they watching a respectful interaction or are they watching an argument take place? Are they watching um, top down dismissive forms of communication? And that can happen either way in either person's case. When there's a teacher's aide in the classroom, what type of interaction are they watching between the teacher and the teacher aide or between the teacher and the student teacher? This matters when they walk through the hallways and they watch teachers interacting or they watch teachers and administrators interacting. What are they observing? If they're observing negative things, we're modeling negative things. And then we wonder, oh gee, why do, our why do our students not work well in groups? On the other hand, if we're modeling good group inquiry ourselves for students, that helps. Um, there's some other things I want to highlight here. Um, for instance, in terms of group work, I am accustomed to seeing the question being asked, do you believe in homogenous grouping? or heterogeneous grouping? Uh, should I group by ability level or should I group by other factors? Should I group so that you've got some more expert students paired with less expert students? Or should I group uh, so that you've got the less expert students here, the more expert students here? The answer varies. Um, so my answer would be yes, depending on context, all of the above. There's a little bit of a problem when you group where students can tell very obviously um, who are the more expert and who are the less expert that gets into labeling issues. Um, so that's a little bit of a danger. Think of it from a learning theory standpoint in terms of the fact that we oftentimes learn best from more expert others and from the fact that sometimes 
students have an easier time listening to and talking with their peers than with teachers. It's a relatability factor and a lowering of resistance. So there's a lot of value to grouping so that you've got a more expert student working with a less expert student. Be careful here too. You always want to be careful with various things, but if you've always got the more expert student being the more expert student in every case throughout the entire school year, and that does happen, that student never has a chance to work in groups with a more expert learner, except when that student is maybe in conference with you as a teacher. So find opportunities to change things up a little bit. When we talk about the classroom as a community, I'm a big fan of Barbara Rogoff's concept of a community of learners. Think about what it means to be a community. Common sense of understood values, ethos, roles that we play. Think about what makes for a well-run community, a community in which we enjoy being part of. Think about how communities fall apart. Think about how communities fall into wars and disputes in real life outside of the classroom. Same basic thing applies to your classroom. So make sure that this is a productive, constructive community where oh, you are learners working together with common goals. And role play matters. Now at the early childhood level, with role play we would be talking about, for example, taking on imaginative role play as a beast or as a different identity. And this is a very creative cognitive leap that young children make that is a transformative step for the mind. But right now I'm talking about a different type of role play. I'm talking about for middle and secondary even taking on the roles of professionals. For instance, if you are studying geography as a middle school student or a secondary student, take on the role of a professional geographer. The identity work, the sense of I am a geographer, the methods of inquiry, the professional values, the professional ethos. That means studying what geographers do. That means studying the techniques, the scientific method in a very real way. When students in an English class might study literature or literary criticism, take on the role of a professional literary critic and a professional writer when they write about it. That means studying the techniques. That means the identity work. Um, study the work of Joan Bruner, for instance, who had a lot to say about this. Sorry about that. Okay, so next I want to get into um, the total physical response. A total physical response can be used in the general classroom of four students in all grade levels, K through 12. It can be used in science, math, English, etc. It can be used with general um, education students who are English only students, but it is often and most frequently associated with second language learners. And it's also associated in exceptional student education. Um, exceptional student education often will rely on total physical response too because of the value that is placed on multi-sensory learning um, in, my, in many exceptional student education uh, programs. Please make sure that you do uh, watch the videos that I've linked here with the PowerPoint when you receive the PowerPoint um, because those videos provide you with examples 
of total physical response in action in an actual classroom. I want this to be something real to you that you actually observe in action, not just simply listen to me talk about it on a video from my apartment. Total physical response, like I said, is very much multisensory. It relies on words, on um, learning the vocabulary word, repeating the vocabulary word ver verbally very clearly. It involves uh, gestures, expressions, use of props. Uh, for instance, uh, if you are providing a vocabulary word in uh, that might mean something in a person's second language, bring an artifact that illustrates metaphorically or symbolically what that word means from within that student's culture. Um, that's called realia. Uh, and, I, and that's a very powerful way of helping that student remember what that word means, a symbolic representation, a very real physical symbolic rep representation of what that word means can very, very much help. Okay, so preparation is absolutely key when we talk about uh, total physical response. Make sure that you have pre-planned your vocabulary. Make sure that you've thought about what things might confuse a student. Make sure you think about various meanings that a word can take on in different contexts. Um, when words can have multiple meanings in different contexts, that can be extremely confusing for second language learners. Um, when a word can have different meanings with slightly different pronunciation that, or different spellings, um, that can be very confusing. So think about all that stuff and make sure you plan ahead for equipment props pictures that might help you too. Okay, so there are some steps that you want to take in a good total physical response activity. First, as a teacher, uh, this is similar to you know, uh, what Pearson and eventually Fisher and Fry would call the I do it, we do it, you do it thing in many ways. Um, in fact, as you uh, look through this, you should see echoes here. Because remember, Fisher and Fry would be the first to say they did not invent I do it, we do it, you do it. They got it from the work of P. David Pearson um, and his research on scaffolding techniques and ways of, of, of making sure that as students are guided within, uh, through helps and prompts and techniques and think aloud, you know, the scaffolding within the, the zone of proximal development, as this guidance takes, um, takes place, eventually students take on increasing independence so that eventually the student takes over independently and with mastery. Um, and that's the you do it part of I do it, we do it, you do it uh, that we're talking about. So it wasn't, it's not something that's copyrighted. And uh, total physical response has a great uh, deal of similarity here uh, with that scaffolding technique. As a teacher, you can start by saying the vocabulary word for students in a careful way, well-pronounced way. As you do this, you would want to include gestures, think about your facial expression, bring in props or realia um, to help illustrate the meaning of the word. Word of caution here. Be very, very careful about your pronunciation. You want it to be very clear, easy to understand. Think about ways in which you personally might pronounce words that are a little bit less clear, that can confuse people. And oftentimes we take that sort of thing for granted. For instance, as you listen to me, it's very possible uh, is that as you listen to this video, there are some words that you might think, oh, he should have pronounced that a little bit more clearly. It's very possible that you might be thinking, he says, um, too much or uh, too much. I know that. 
when I have rewatched my own self on some of these videos, it's actually very good for me to do because sometimes I cringe at that and it's something that I can improve. And I think that these videos will actually help me to improve in that way because placing videos actually out there publicly on YouTube instead of within a university system or in the closed venue of a class, it just forces you to think about, okay, what type of public image am I putting out there? Um, I think it's good for you to record yourself as you teach for that reason. It'll force you to think about uh, what do you sound like? There might be gestures, hesitations, ums, uhs that you don't really like, but you might not even think about it until you watch and observe yourself. In my, think about your background and how that can affect your communication, your dialect, and I would say dialects. When I think about myself, my way of speaking, my particular dialect is rather unique to me, and that's okay. We all have, we talk about in linguistics, language, dialect, well, language, there are some linguists out there that debate, is there such a thing as language, English language, Mandarin, or are we really talking about collection of dialects? And we can even break that down. Do I have a single dialect? Well, I don't talk like my parents. No one in my family talks exactly like me. I'm not exactly sure why I talk this way. Maybe it's my way of having a little bit of a love for things English when I was young. I'm a little bit of an Anglophile. More than a little bit of an Anglophile, actually, I'll admit to it. Um, we all have our biases, and that's okay. And especially when I was young, I developed a real strong Anglophile uh, sense. Uh, Shakespeare and all that, I fell in love with it when I was young. So that probably influences the way that I talk. My genetics, um, when it comes to my background, um, are inherited largely British and Irish, so that impacts the way that I talk. But then think about where all I've lived. Born in Pittsburgh as an infant, moved to the Boise, Idaho region, lived in Boise, Idaho, age infancy to age eight, Klamath Falls, Oregon, that southern Oregon region, um, for eight months after that. Then on my ninth birthday, moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, lived in Pittsburgh till almost age 13. Then age 13 until my late 30s, uh, Central Florida, the Sanford and Orlando areas of uh, Central Florida. Then Clemson University, which is upstate South Carolina for my PhD, full-time PhD student there. And after that, St. Louis, Missouri for four years while teaching at Harris Stowe State University. Then University of Arkansas Little Rock, as I make this video in summer 2020, 2020, in the middle of the COVID-19 situation, I'm two months away from the anniversary of joining University of Arkansas Little Rock. So I've been in Little Rock for less than a year. And part of my time has been spent, of course, being indoors with COVID-19, and I've been trying to spend a lot of time with my wife uh, whenever there's an opportunity. So it's not like I've been immersed in Little Rock culture yet. But think about all those influences on me. Think about how that influences my dialect. I don't talk exactly like a person from Idaho, but I've got no doubt that if you listen closely enough to me, you can see influences of the Western and the Idaho in me just a little bit, at least some, more than a little bit maybe, because most of my extended family is from Idaho. Um, if you were to listen to me, you can maybe pick up a little bit of Pittsburgh in me. But honestly speaking, and I mean this with love, 
as I use this word, but I don't speak like a Pittsburgh Yinzer. Um, hopefully anyone from Pittsburgh that ever listens to this will understand I mean that with humor. <laughs> um, Self-deprecating humor is kind of a Pittsburgh trait that I love. But I don't speak like that. I love the city of Pittsburgh, but, and there probably is some influence on of Pittsburgh in the way that I speak. But honestly speaking, and I was there for some formative years, age nine to age 13 is fairly formative. I wouldn't say that I have precisely a Pittsburgh accent. You go on YouTube if you're not from um, most of my students. I make this video, of course, you've, um, many of my students are from Arkansas and Missouri. I've noticed uh, we have a large number of students from Missouri in the program. Uh, so you may or may not have been from Pittsburgh. So if you're not familiar with Pittsburgh accent, look it up. You can easily go on YouTube and find videos, Pittsburgh accent, and you'll quickly pick up a K Maybe you see just a little bit of hint in that with me, but not much. For instance, um, on a humorous note, there are some videos where from um, you're from Pittsburgh, if that sort of thing. And I love those videos for humor, but I don't talk like that. You listen to fl the way Florida people talk. Honestly speaking, I've spent the majority of my adult life in Florida, but I don't talk precisely like a native Floridian either. South Carolina, when I tell people that my PhD is from Clemson, especially if I'm talking a little bit more slowly like I do in a teaching situation, like with this video or a conference presentation, when I'm in various situations, I do slow down my speech so that people can understand me. And so sometimes, especially if I'm talking a little bit more slow, sometimes people mistake that for what people might call Southern drawl or Southern gentleman. But I would argue I don't really speak like a South Carolina Southern accent. I don't speak like a Missourian, even though I was in Missouri for four years and I still have deep ties to Missouri. So, and I haven't been in Arkansas long enough to speak like someone from Arkansas. And yet all of this thing with likely the exception of Arkansas, because I haven't been here long enough, but all of this influences my way of talking in some interesting and wonderful ways, because I value who I am and I kind of like the way that I talk, even if it can make things more difficult at times. But, so it's nothing negative when I say that I have to be self-aware about things in the way that I pronounce words that can perhaps be difficult for my students and especially second language learners. Be self-reflective for yourself too when it comes to that. Because you personally, even if you're not aware of it, you might think, um, I speak normal. But whatever I speak normal means. Uh, but be careful. Don't go too far. And this is an important point. If you go too far in slowing yourself down, and especially if the slowing of down of your speech is accompanied with raising the vocal tone a little bit louder, then you could by accident be committing a microaggression, insulting a second language learner. And I'm taking a little bit of a slow down here because this is an area where many teachers, as they're trying to do total physical response or other forms of instruction for second language learners, without even intending it, commit actions that wound students. People who are second language learners in the United States, without necessarily admitting it to English only speakers, unless they're very close to someone, may potentially, I say may potentially because I can't speak for everyone, but may potentially have been through years of unintended or intended microaggressions 
things like English only speakers slowing down a little bit too much in an exaggerated way, raising the vocal tone, laughing, making grimaces, um, looking down on that person, um, using hyperbole to exaggerate the way that it sounds like someone from China or Mexico or Vietnam speaks. It's not nice, but it happens. I'll give you an example from a movie scene that is hyperbole. I'm going to describe the movie scene in context, but then I'm going to let you know why I am describing it in a way that is very important and I think very illustrative for teachers. Granted, movie scenes are hyperbole by nature, especially comedies. If you've seen the movie Rush Hour, or even seen the meme that's out there, whether you've seen the full movie or not, there's a scene where the Jackie Chan character, they're both police officers, um, is getting off of a plane. Jackie Chan, both the character in this movie, as well as the real Jackie Chan, native of China, um, English not the first is not the first language. Um, and... The fellow police officer, the American police officer, immediately assumes with the Jackie Chan character being second language learner, not a native English speaker, might not speak English very well, might not understand English very well. And so in an exaggerated way says, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Now, I'm pretty sure that the reason Jackie Chan, who is outspoken uh, in defense of Chinese heritage and very much beloved in China, very active in China in promoting Chinese culture and in America too, um, and honestly speaking, what, depending on your political views, you may or may not like what I'm about to say about, you may think this as a positive or a negative about China, depending on your ideological point of view, but Jackie Chan is very strongly aligned with and um, a promoter of the Chinese government within China um, for holidays and events like the Chinese New Year and so on and so forth. So very proud of his heritage. There's no way that he would agree to be in a scene that illustrates this sort of thing that I just described, unless the next step is to illustrate the foolishness, the mistake of this scene and bring out some personal pride, personal identity. So in the, the next thing that happens, of course, if you've seen the movie, is that Jackie Chan speaks English very, very well. Um, and in fact, is highly knowledgeable, highly expert. And so the American police officer is made to look fairly foolish for doing that. Now think for a moment about what's happening in this scene and what it illustrates for you as a classroom teacher, a future classroom teacher or current classroom teacher. An assumption a stereotype was made by the American. And as a result of that assumption and that stereotype, the voice got raised and the words got pronounced very slowly. It was kind of in a shouting way even. Granted, this is hyperbole. Most people don't shout in real life. Um, now, Jackie Chan, the character, had enough power, enough expertise as an experienced expert teacher and enough training in the English language, according to the script, to overcome it and to show that this act is foolish. Your students won't have that empowerment. Number one, as a teacher, you are in a place of power. Many of your students, especially second language learners, might not feel so emboldened and empowered to illustrate for you the foolishness of your act. 
and they might not have the linguistic skills in English yet that a Jackie Chan character has, especially if you're teaching um, an ESOL or TESOL class. So it's very important to be, uh, to be aware of this. And if your student is a second language learner, number one, this stereotype is applied to second language learners in many cases. But I would argue, honestly speaking, I'm willing to bet and that it's probably more common for that raised voice, exaggerated to slow down thing like you see with it, did you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth scene that you can look up if you haven't seen it. It's probably more common with second language learners who are people of color, to be blunt. Um, and probably pretty common with Asians. So be careful here. Because here's the thing about racism in the classroom setting and in outside the classroom setting. So many times I will hear people say, how do you know that that person is racist? Do you know that person's heart? I can't speak to whether that person is racist or a person with I statement would be, I'm not a racist. That's not what I intended. I've got ex friends who are this and that, you know, um, or I have a girlfriend, boyfriend now or in the past who is this and that or whatever. Um, that's not the point. It's the effect as well as the power that matters. Not the intent, I cannot speak to a given teacher's heart. I don't know their heart, I can't read into that. I can't read a person's mind, I can't read intent. I can only um, take a person's word on that. But effect, the outcome, the impact, the harm, the hurt, the pain can be real, even if it wasn't actually intended. Remember, effect, not intent, is and effect as well as power is what we really need to think about when we think about these microaggressions with overlays of racism. Be very, very careful here. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second and maybe a transition thing um, after we've talked about a heavy topic and move on to the next step. So we talked about what the teacher does. That's the first step. The teacher models the word along with gestures and movement and props. A second step would be the role of a single student. Allow for a volunteer. Importantly here, highlight volunteer. Uh, the damage that you can potentially do in total physical response setting if you call on a non-volunteer is that a student could feel resistant or embarrassed. They might mispronounce a word themselves and feel embarrassed. And so if you do that, you may have created a resistant learner, um, whether it is for one day or for a lot more than one day. So be careful. I really strongly recommend volunteers. Now, when you have this volunteer, the student does precisely what you just did. Pronounce the word the same way, same gestures, same body movements, same props. The repetition makes a difference. The student is a peer closer to the fellow students, so there's that connection that matters too. Then we get into group. So after you as a teacher and one volunteer student have 
pronounce this word, now the full group as a class uh, will pronounce this word together along with the gestures and um, the expressions and so forth and the movements. Again, this is basically based upon multi-sensory um, assumptions that we learn words and concepts more deeply, more in a more nuanced way when the verbal, the linguistic, is combined with broad range of multisensory um, ways of making meaning as well. We can move to writing. There are various ways of doing this. I'm giving you one example. You can always do things like the language experience approach to writing. You can have students write short responses, one minute prompts, or as, as shown here, you can write the word or phrase on the wall so that everyone can see it. Uh, there's various ways of combining writing with it, but the important thing is that writing does need to be involved in one way, shape, or form with this total physical response. Uh, that's because you want to make sure that you're combining the oral with the written in, this, in the long-term memory for the sake of these neural connections that are made. Repetition matters. So again, you repeat the word, repeat the gesture, do it multiple times, not just once. And even two or three weeks later, after this has been done, um, when you move on to additional words, you might come back to a word that you did two weeks ago uh, so that that word is not forgotten. There's various different ways in which you can do total physical response. It isn't limited to the straight row form of total physical response. You can do the circle activity like you see here. Um, you can do Simon Says. You can toss a bean bag around. There's various ways of, of repeating words as um, uh, and um, using movement to, to combine the pronunciation of words. You can toss a football around. You can toss a baseball around. You can play a game of makeshift basketball with paper into garbage can while pronouncing a word. There's so many ways. And then we get into a little bit of exper experiential learning. So this is separate from total physical response. Although it is, it, total physical response draws from the value of experiential learning. Um, but experiential learning, which is largely used in Deweyan, as well as, again, that name, Vygotsky and sociocultural approaches. Uh, it's the idea that as a student learns that the, when you put something into action and you actually experience it, you learn it more deeply than just simply just simply learning it without the experience. Let's put it this way. If I have, you think of yourself as a good teacher. I am a good teacher, right? I might give you classroom instruction. I might train you. I might have you go observe and take notes about what you observe. You might even do a little bit of student teaching and you, or even a full semester of student teaching. But here's the thing, without the experience of overcoming obstacles and actually being a teacher, with that net removed, because honestly speaking, as a student teacher, you do have a net. Um, you do have a safety net in various ways. Not the least of which is that if you really fall flat, there are interventions that are available. Let's hope you never do that. But until you actually experience something, you do something, there's always going to be that doubt. Can I do it or not? Same thing goes with your knowledge of vocabulary, your knowledge of concepts. There's always going to be, and Dewey wrote a lot about this in how we think in 1933 and various research has backed this up long since that over the decades. 
Um, but we never completely learn something until we actually put it into action and experience and it becomes real for us. And then finally, and this I'm going to close on this note, another approach to teaching is called transformative teaching. Transformative teaching, as I'm talking about it here, draws on the social justice approach, critical theory um, approach uh, to instruction. Think, for instance, about bell hooks. Think about um, Paulo Freire. Think about Gloria Lads and Billings, for instance, with transformative teaching. The idea here, and I'll focus for a moment on Paulo Freire. The idea here is that the teacher allows the student to become the teacher. So let's say that you're teaching a concept within literature. You're studying Macbeth, for instance. Well, there's many ways of teaching Macbeth. Generally speaking, Macbeth tends to be taught in terms of let's study the book, let's listen to a book on tape. Maybe you watch a movie, uh, and there's not many movies that I can think of where Macbeth was done justice. Honestly speaking, I can't think of a movie about Macbeth that I like um, offhand. And I know that there are movies out there. And you talk about it some, but it doesn't really become real in that case. Maybe students take a test. It's disconnected. Maybe you show students videos about England. It's still disconnected in Scotland. Um, still disconnected. Well, what if you allow students to perform? What if you allow students to do a play? What if you allow students to take on the identity work, role play, as characters of Macbeth? Now comes the real step. What if you allow students to go beyond that, create plays themselves? maybe based upon Macbeth, maybe they eventually, over time, take it in a whole new direction. In Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire. The oppressor and oppressed narrative is reversed so that the student becomes the teacher. The student takes power. Um, you've got performances, plays, writing experiences, language experiences. Remember, Paulo Freire deeply was a scholar of literacy. And so, in the process of learning language and learning language in deep and nuanced ways, there's also a sense of here's who I am, here's this very real, created by the student mask of who I have to be for society. Here's who I have to be in certain situations. Here's this mask of who I really am. And who I really am might not be limited or even accurate to this physical skin. Allow the student to actually create a mask that um, is true to who I am. Perhaps in the process, the student gets to say, I am somebody, I matter, my family matters, my culture matters, my personal identity as well as cultural identity matters. In the process, too, we can talk about oppression. Now, that takes cuts as a teacher, doesn't it? Uh, we can talk about oppression. We can take that risk. We can talk about pain. 
we can talk about, we can talk about things that are wrong, things in that student's life, things in society, social injustices, inequities that need to be and ought to be changed, transformed. There should be a personal transformation in transformative teaching, but it also, all approaches to critical theory-based instruction and um, reconstructionist-based instruction, if you've studied uh, curriculum theory, are by nature political. They're by nature reject the very idea of curriculum even possibly being apolitical. It's the old saying, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So we're going to decide. It's potentially risky for you as a teacher. I know that. You might have students or parents with different political views than those being expressed by other fellow students or parents. If your political views start to show, and if you take the step of transformative teaching, I've got news for you, they probably will show at some point, whether you want them to or not. They probably will show in various ways. Mine show. Now, granted, yes, University of Arkansas Little Rock is a public university, but we also have, of course, um, freedom, various forms of freedom as professors. And I'm making this video for my students. As I make this video, of course, I've got in mind my graduate students. And so, of course, you're adults. In many cases, adults with professional careers and experience. So you can handle the fact that you can tell, you can pretty much tell what my where my politics lie. I don't necessarily have to spell out, here's who I vote for, but you can tell by the nature of what I spend the most time on, by the nature of what I choose to include in my syllabus, by the nature of what I publish if you look me up, and I encourage you to look up all your teachers, all your professors, the nature of my peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed publications, because I also blog um, every once in a while, easily found. But all of that stuff, that's not apolitical. It's political. That's okay. Doesn't mean I'm going to grade you down depending on your uh, political points of views, and you don't have to pretend that you agree with me. I don't care. That doesn't impact my grade. I care about your professional growth as a teacher. Um, oh, I lean, obviously, in the pragmatist, social constructivist, slash critical theory and reconstructionist points of view. I don't, but I've also published social efficiency. I've, if you've taken a course from me, or if you just look it up uh, in some of my courses, especially the course on curriculum theory, I include the quality assurance chapter, a quality assurance chapter that I've written. Well, quality assurance is from the social efficiency paradigm. So what does that mean? That means I'm eclectic. I'm able to draw from different points of view. Same goes for many of you as teachers. You're probably eclectic. You can probably see strengths and weaknesses in various approaches. That's okay. Um, I do too. I draw from various approaches, including perennialism. And so, you know, because one thing we can learn from perennialism is the valuing of the humanities. As an English teacher, you won't hear me saying, oh, I don't value the humanities. Give me a break. English is a humanity. So again, I want to close out this video by saying this. Regardless of where you stand, 
politically background, where you've been born, how you've been raised. Think also about your students. Your students matter. Your relationships matter. Your sense of care matters. Your students need you to care. The approaches, the methods to instruction we've, that we've talked about in these two videos. As I said early in the first video, there is no single approach to instruction that is a one-size-fits-all best approach to instruction at all times for all students. It doesn't exist. You've heard me talk about transformative instruction um, that you can find more about in the writings of Gloria Ladson Billings and Carol Lee in her work on cultural modeling. And of course, um, the wonderful work of Pedro Negrur and um, a wonderful work of Ernest Morel. I would, um, out of Notre Dame, I would really encourage you to look up what is being done by Ernest Morel if you haven't already. And you can tell I'm a fan of theirs, a big fan, huge fan of Morel. But, um, there's no one size fits all. There's no perfect silver bullet pill to meet the needs of your students. I will say this. I strong, I can tell you what's more likely to work than not. Planning versus not planning. Planning is going to work better. Um, care versus not care. Care is a lot more likely to work. If your students feel like they are somebody versus I'm nobody, I am somebody that's more likely to result in learning. And on that note, I'll say good night. Thank you very much.